So when people ask, where's the science on low carbohydrate diets, you can go to the source of all information today, Wikipedia, <laughs> and put medical research related to low carbohydrate diets into Wikipedia and there are many many studies there with summaries of them. Uh, it's not hard to get this information even you doctors out there who are skeptical and have no time the information is there. The Nutrition and Metabolism, Metabolism Society has a website that has lots of information uh, for the science. Probably the best study today, and I have a medical student rotation where students come to learn about the dietary therapy and, and weight loss medicine at Duke. And the study I make them most familiar with is called the DIRECT study. It was done in Israel, and it's uh, uh, the the study, first paper was in New England Journal of Medicine, the second one was in Circulation. It's a multi-year study with various diets and all of the people who followed the diet and lost weight and had reduction in blood pressure had improvements in their carotid thickness, which is a measure of atherosclerosis. And so that's the best study with the best outcome as of yet uh, for supporting this kind of diet. Obesity and metabolic syndrome, there are meta-analyses now, which means there are studies of studies and, and summaries of lots of different studies. That information is, that's kind of like old news, and I'm going to leave that to the other speakers today at, because it's, it's not so novel. Um, I'm going to talk about type 2 diabetes because the science is emerging and the, while the knowledge has been known a long time, the formal publications are becoming more and more out there. And then I'll end up with talking about cancer and some other technological advances in regard to ketogenic diets. So when you talk about diabetes, there, the major contributors to type 2 diabetes, which is the most common type of diabetes, it's mostly related to obesity. You have dietary carbohydrate that raises the blood sugar. You have this, a sedentary lifestyle. Now in North Carolina, let me just transport you to Durham, North Carolina, where most people don't exercise. Well, and then when you get over a certain BMI, a certain body mass index, which is your height and weight together, you don't feel like exercising. So uh, sedentary lifestyle, don't assume that everyone out there is going to be like you all who want to be out there playing every weekend when it's sunny. Um, then insulin resistance from overweight and obesity is the contributor to diabetes. So you can affect dietary carbohydrate, but if there's still obesity, there's still insulin resistance, there may be type 2 diabetes. And I'm going to go into detail about these, but not so much about the sedentary lifestyle. So in my clinic at Duke University, I don't talk about exercise at first to help people lose weight. Everyone comes in thinking they have to exercise to lose weight, and actually the science says that exercise doesn't help you lose weight unless you keep the diet intake the same. So people think of working up an appetite with exercise, that's typically what happens. So exercise is not such a great uh, tool for me, an obesity medicine specialist. I focus on the diet mainly. And here's why we focus on the dietary carbohydrate. Dietary carbohydrate has been described for a long time as the main factor that raises the blood sugar. So we have a graph here of the blood glu uh, plasma glucose, which is blood sugar, uh, and you have a meal with carbohydrate and the blood sugar goes up. And then in response, because the body doesn't like the blood sugar going up too high, it's very tightly controlled. There's an insulin response in the body from the pancreas if you want to get technical, and this insulin response lowers the blood sugar by helping the blood sugar get into all of the cells. So the insulin helps clear the blood sugar to keep it down into this, this optimal range of blood sugar. So now you just go a little bit up on the blood sugar and you have diabetes. So diabetes is a disorder of an elevated blood sugar. So you eat carbohydrate, the blood sugar goes up, the insulin goes up, in response and the blood sugar comes back down and this is for the last 50 years what's been taught as normal in, a, in the normal adult human. Now normal doesn't necessarily mean optimal but it's what has been taught. I was taught this in medical school. People in medical school today are taught that this is normal and that's if you're eating carbohydrate. The, the, eating carbohydrate is also tempered by the other things you eat. And in 
in fact, it turns out that by eating fat with the carbohydrate, you slow the absorption of the carbohydrate. So I, I want to acknowledge that it's more complicated than just eating carbohydrate, but the carbohydrate is the main factor. The, the sugars and starches are the carbohydrates. Those are the things, and starches are digested to sugar, so we're really talking about sugars and starches as carbohydrates. Uh, fat can temper the, the absorption of your carbohydrate, which is why you might hear me say in the clinic, I want you to have heavy cream with your berries so it slows the absorption of your berries. The cream that you eat protects you from the berries. Now, some of you are gonna say that, it's just really crazy. By the end of the day, I hope you understand why we talk in these terms in our clinic. So some people talk, in broad terms, you can talk about good carbs and bad carbs, and to a certain extent, you know, this is what just about every diet doctor has said for the last 30 or 40 years, don't have the junk foods, right? You know, even a, a ultra low fat, high carbohydrate diet doesn't want you to have junk food on it, right? So you could say that all of these popular diets have the same theme, and that is, just eat real food, but I want to get it a little more complicated. It, it's more complicated, I want to go a little further, but you could categorize your vegetables as your good carbs. That's where you want to get your carbs, and all of these other things, not so much. Now the scientists, there's a, a theme of, if we can't fix it, let's study it in greater and greater detail, right? So, uh, you know, if you can't fix it, well, let's talk about the glycemic index of foods. So let's talk about foods, of course, these are carbohydrate-containing foods, and categorize them in terms of how much they raise the blood sugar, right? So you have this scale called the glycemic index. Glucose, <coughs> drinking sugar, is the standard against which the other foods are compared. So let's say you have an index of 100 for having a 50 gram amount of, of a certain set amount of glucose, same amount. And so whole wheat bread has a glycemic index of 72, white rice 72, brown rice 66. So I, a lot of my patients come in, I say, well, I don't want you to have white rice. And they say, well, how about brown rice? And I say, no, 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 it's still rice. And the glycemic index is still very high, meaning it raises the blood sugar, because I, I don't want the blood sugar to go up when you'll hear why in a minute. Uh, so you go down now on these, uh, the glycemic index, the foods that I'm gonna ask people to eat to lose weight and to become ketogenic aren't even on this scale. <laughs> so when people say to you, is the glycemic index good? And well, it explains what happens in your body when you eat carbohydrates, but they're still raising the blood sugar too much, in my opinion, when you're doing a ketogenic diet. Well, it's the way the science is. Um, so that's the glycemic index, which just is another way to categorize carbohydrate-containing foods. Let's get into some of the science that's behind this. You know, all of this stuff so far has no controversy to it at all. And through the years, I could find studies looking at the amount of carbohydrate. CHO is, means carbohydrate for short. And the scientists were, were through the years, looking at lowering the carbohydrate, but they met this wall. At the, the, the prevailing wisdom was you don't want to go below 50 or 30 or even 20% carbohydrate in the diet because, you know, that's going to harm people. So it was unethical for a long time, quote, unethical. I don't think it was unethical, but people thought it was unethical to study diets that had very low carbohydrate in them. So. But that's okay, we still summarize what was done. And the a hemoglobin A1C, now this is for diabetes, hemoglobin A1C summarizes the blood sugars over a three month period. So it's one test that you can take that gives you a good in indication of how the diabetes has been. And a good A1C is under six, uh, a normal under 5.5, six, somewhere in there. Um, our diabetologists settle for A1Cs of seven in their diabetic, and that's just outrageously high. It's not normal, but see, they don't really address the diet as well as we do. Um, so you could see even in the best hands, the best 
you could achieve with a hemoglobin A1C was about 6%, and we want 5.5 or 5 or even 4.5. How many of you know your A1Cs? And how many of you are under 5 on your A1Cs, under 6 your A1Cs? Okay, so this is normal. Um, sevens, eights, I wonder. If, um, so even one of the most recent studies that looked at lowering the GI, now that you know the GI level, glycemic index, it, it relates to blood sugar, they lowered the GI, but they still had a lot of carbohydrate in the diet, and it really had very little effect on the A1C. So the amount of carbohydrate and the GI of the carbohydrate matters, but just addressing the, the glycemic index without regard to lowering the carbohydrate does not have much an effect on the blood sugar. Um, now there were some researchers who thought, well, what if you didn't have carbohydrate in the diet at all? And this is also now known as paleo diet, primal diet, low carb diet, ketogenic diet, all of these, but uh, it's been around a long time, but w the studies were just done recently this is the response after you eat a meal without any carbohydrate at all, the response in glucose. There's no increase in blood sugar after the meal. This is the response to insulin when you're eating the carbohydrate we saw before, and there's the response in insulin after not eating carbohydrate. Hmm. So if, if there's a reason to lower the glucose and lower the insulin, whatever that reason may be, Oh, let's see, glucose elevation is called diabetes. Hmm. Uh, if there's a reason that you want to do that, this is, looks like an effective measure, right? Well, there's a saying in science that the hallmark of science is replication. So whenever you see one study, you say, wow, that's interesting. I want to see another one, right? right? You just think that in the back of your mind. So this has been replicated over and over. Oh, and it's right, it's just basic physiology. <laughs> But we're in an era where physiology isn't trusted unless you have some sort of publication, some study like this. So it's kind of, we're going to get into this, why we're in the state today of all of the researchers not really talking about this. It's, it, it's kind, of, it, kind of crazy. So Manny Noakes in Australia did a similar study where great detail here of what the foods were, which I loved in that, in that study, and a similar finding where if you ate carbohydrate, here's the glucose and the insulin response, excuse me, in, glucose insulin. Um, and then if you had, they call it a diet specific glucose tolerance sense, meaning in this red line, they didn't eat any carbohydrate because it was the low carbohydrate diet. And then, so the glucose doesn't go up and the insulin doesn't go up after eating a meal without carbohydrate. Or now I should say, the insulin doesn't go up much because insulin does have another role other than lowering the blood sugar. And we think that it's probably the role insulin was part of our, our metabolism in general. It helps protein get into the cells as well. So insulin helps in amino acids get into the cells. So protein has a little bit of a, uh, a gets, uh, creates an insulin increase a little bit, but not anywhere to the degree of when you eat carbohydrate. Uh, when I was faced with the first study of doing the low carb diet, I uh, was um, uh, given a book by a patient of mine who was a used bookstore owner and she said, you might like this book, Dr. Westman, I know you're kind of a history buff. I looked to what people were advising in the early 1900s for the treatment of diabetes. And this is the basically a, a summary of the page in the Osler textbook of medicine from 1923. So they didn't have medications yet. Insulin was discovered in 1921, hadn't made it into this textbook. They didn't have the internet. Uh, so, and it took time for insulin to, to uh, go around. But the recommendation was 10 grams of carbohydrates for the whole day for a diabetic. They were measuring urine sugar, not blood sugar. And what they knew is that if you didn't feed someone at all, the urine sugar would clear at, in a matter of time. And then if you added carbohydrate back, the urine sugar would show up again. You added protein back, the urine sugar would show up. But if you added fat, there was no change in the urine sugar, urine glucose. 
We can do better than the urine glucose today because many of you have monitors to check your blood glucose and it usually takes an increase of blood glucose to about 150 or 200 before you see it in the urine. So we can do better in terms of controlling diabetes today than these docs did. But what they found is that the average amount of, so people couldn't tolerate much carbohydrate and in, in not have urine sugar. And then you added back protein and they showed sugar again. Advanced low carb ketogenic theme is that some protein gets turned into sugar. So you don't want to do too high a protein diet if you want to keep the blood sugars low, if you want to stay ketogenic. And then fat had no, no change in the urine sugar, same with blood sugar. Um, the strict diet, I, I show this, I have it in my, uh, my clinic. Uh, it's a tattered book. There's a YouTube of me and Dr. Haney and, uh, uh, Dr. Haney and, and I in Nashville where I look at the book and show it. And so it's, it's out there. Um, the, it's not, uh, not being hidden by any means. Um, best I can tell, medicines came out. The prevailing wisdom was we don't want to treat diabetics differently than normal people. Let's let them have the carbohydrates and we'll just treat them with medicines. There was never a study comparing this diet to the standard care that you get from an endocrinologist today, which is some medicine plus a higher carb diet. The study has never been done. I want to do it. So what happened was there was a leap from this treatment to a medical treatment and then you have to eat carbohydrates if you're on a medicine that lowers the blood sugar. Otherwise you're gonna get a low blood sugar. <laughs> so dietitians have come up to me, you can't tell people to not eat carbohydrates. And I say, yes I can. <laughs> and because I don't put people on the medications. So I'm a rare doctor who controls the medicine and the food. Dietitians, even certified diabetes educators, get the training of you must put them on dietary carbohydrate because the doctor put them on a medicine that makes the blood sugar go low. So the blood sugar rarely, if ever, goes low without being on a medicine to treat the diabetes. So this is one area of, you know, I've met well-intentioned people who are as passionate as me about helping people. And it's just a different approach. And, and they're stuck. These, the people advising high carb for diabetes are stuck because their patients are already on a medicine to treat the diabetes. And they don't really need to be on that medicine if they address the, the diet and the lifestyle, the obesity, that insulin resistance thing. I do a lot of teaching of, about just basic physiology. Um, I have not yet found a medical student or a doctor without me prompting them who know that there's a spoonful of sugar in the entire human bloodstream. It's in front of our faces. It's been there. It, it, uh, there's a great blog by Mike Eads who wrote Protein Power and had a clinical practice using low carb diets where he, he calculates this out and, and I do as well in, in front of, you can take this as a uh, question in front of anyone who, who has measured their blood sugar and it comes out as 100 milligrams per deciliter. You, this is a high school, uh, or even now, gosh, this is a middle school level mathematics and you cancel out these things and it, you have to know that there's about five to seven liters of blood in the body and you end up with about seven grams, which is a heaping spoonful of sugar and that's all there is in the, your bloodstream. If you go up to a teaspoon and a half you're a diabetic. So now if you use this in your education, you're gonna start seeing people who put two and two together. Then why would I wanna drink a Coca-Cola that has the equivalent of 10 teaspoons of sugar? And you say, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Good idea. Uh, why would I wanna eat three servings of carbohydrate, which is 45 grams at every meal, like my diabetologist teaches me, when I know that that's now gonna be 10, 15 times the amount of sugar and I wanna keep my blood sugar low? Yeah, good question. Uh, so arming people with the knowledge and, and you know, the ability to check the blood sugar has taken the control out of the doctors and into the hands of you, the patient. 
So you can manipulate that. The classic story of that is Dr. Richard Bernstein, a type 1 diabetic. His blog and, and website is called The Diabetes Solution or normalbloodsugars.com, something like that. Richard Bernstein, he was a type 1 diabetic, an engineer. He got a blood sugar monitor and just followed the, everything that he could do to keep the blood sugar low. A brilliant fellow. And um, if there's one person on earth who you should see, you have all the money and time in the world, and you want to see the diabetic expert, it would be Dick Bernstein in Mamaroneck, New York. Uh, go see him, um, and you'll learn so much, because he's lived the, the life of a diabetic. He knows, and then put it in his book, too, but um, that's a great, uh, great resource we still have. So there's five to seven grams of glucose in the human bloodstream of an adult. What about kids? <laughs> so what about giving orange juice, which has five or six teaspoons of sugar, to a child who only has one teaspoon, or a, you know, a, a quarter of a teaspoon in the entire bloodstream? It makes no sense if you're trying to lower the blood sugar, right? And then remember, high blood sugar, that's called diabetes. Same, or this is a medical problem. Now, you can look at... Uh, Various diets and uh, just this is I, there's a reminder, carbohydrate grams on the left hand side. So I look at carbohydrate grams as the metric that's scientifically proven to be the most important thing to keep track of. Not the glycemic index, not the percent carbs in the, the, the diet, that's right. It's the carbohydrate grams per day. Um, and then you get below 50 or in some people 20 or in some postmenopausal women who are totally sedentary, they may have to stay under 10 grams of carbohydrate a day in order to maintain a higher level of ketones or lose weight or fix the diabetes, whatever they want to accomplish. Uh, oh, and the, the typical American diet still has about 250 to 300 grams of carbohydrate in it. Remember starches, any carbohydrate pretty much gets digested to sugar. So this is, uh, let's see, five grams times, this is 60 times the amount of blood sugar in your entire bloodstream that people are eating over the course of the day as a typical American. It's amazing we're not all diabetic. Oh, wait, we almost all are. Oh, no. <laughs> well, no. <laughs> glucose intolerance, uh, insulin resistance, glucose intolerance, this pre-diabetes, if you include pre-diabetes and diabetes, it's, uh, it's all increasing. So this is not good as a society. Um, if there's one study about diabetes and low-carb diets that was required reading for students, for, for health professionals, it's a study by Dr. Bowden, uh, the Annals of Internal Medicine, 2005, showing the same response of low-carb meals among patients with diabetes. So, you know, I live in a world of well, you showed that study that it wasn't among diabetics, so it doesn't count. Well, yeah, it does count, but, it, but you, we even have studies with diabetes. Um, you hear lots of things. It's a high-protein diet, it's a low-carb diet, it's a high-fat diet. It's a, when Dr. Bowden looked at what people were eating on an ad-lib low-carb diet, meaning they were given free reign of all the foods that have no carbohydrates in them, it turned out not to be a high-protein diet or a, rel or a high fat diet. And um, so when you just tell people to limit carbohydrates, they tend not to change uh, anything other than the carbohydrate they're taking in. And they might still be choosing lean meat or chicken or, or um, the uh, things that they've been accustomed to, the, the meat, uh, the fish, things like that. Um, so the protein and fat don't really change much. As one of my patients said, it's kind of like I'm just not eating the starch on the plate. I'm still having the meat and the veggie. I just don't eat the starch. So some people don't change the other amount, the other things that they eat on a low carb diet much. Um, but this might not be the best situation if you're trying to increase your ketones as much as you can. We'll want to push toward more high fat than, than that. Um, Watching through the years, diabetes and low-carb diets, uh, Jim Hayes had a clinical paper comparing a control group and a low-carb group. And just to get you in uh, a mindset of looking at these kinds of slides, we have a control group on one side and a low-carb group on the other. 
draw an artificial line here. And hemoglobin A1C, that measure of diabetes over three months, we wanted as low as possible, went down in his control group, which used to be a medication high carb, from 8.4 to 7.6, so it worked pretty well. But when he introduced a low carb diet, it went from 9.3 to 6.9%. So you got much greater reduction in the hemoglobin A1C and the diabetes by lowering the carbohydrate in the diet. I visited several doctor's offices as I was starting to do my own research to learn what they were doing and to see their results. And what I was observing is that the average hemoglobin A1C in these practitioners, uh, the O'Neill study, these are all clinical studies, was the practice of Dick Bernstein. And I was seeing hemoglobin A1Cs under 6, and then under 6.5, off medication, which was the better than the goal, at least as good or better than the goal of the typical diabetes teaching, which is we want under 7 on medication. So this was very intriguing to me. Of course, the clinical practitioners don't see people who don't want to come back to see them, right? You, you have a selection bias, um, and then they might tend to select out people who are more motivated. But what I learned is that this is possible. So when everyone said it's not possible, no one can stay on that kind of diet, I, well, au contraire, I, I've seen it. Now, it doesn't mean I can personally keep everyone on that kind of diet, but if you're highly motivated, you have the right teaching, the right, right tools, it's very possible to do it, and you can achieve these kinds of diabetic results. In my clinic, what someone said to me was, I went to the diabetic clinic, and they wanted me to be a good diabetic. Take the medicines, eat the foods. And I went to your clinic, because I didn't want to be a diabetic. The diabetic clinic wanted me to be a good diabetic. And after coming to your clinic, I'm no longer a diabetic. So it's just a different way to go about it. What do you want? I haven't had anyone say yet that they wanted to be a diabetic. So um, when you look at the, the disconnect between the research studies that the, the academic experts do, they have people on, say, a couple hundred grams of carbohydrate for the whole day. And now you know that that's just really ridiculous, considering there's only five grams in the entire bloodstream. And they achieved A1Cs in the seven to eight, nine range. And then in these clinical practices, I was seeing things like this. I wanted my patients to have these sort of results. So all I did is, is followed what these doctors were doing. In England, there was, a, unbeknownst to me, a study going on, which is great, that uh, you know, we can't possibly, as individual researchers, know what's going on around the world. There's a lot of, of, of studies going on that we're not aware of. This one popped up where they put 100 people. R means randomization. In a, in a formal research study, if you have randomization, that means you come to me and you don't know what diet you're going to get. So. This is good because then you can't stack the deck, for example, of everyone who's really motivated, I'll put on my diet, and everyone who's not motivated will get that other diet that I don't really want anyone to really do. So you can stack the deck to make your study look really good, uh, like having uh, how many judges from your country on the, the Olympic <laughs> panel. <laughs> so we try to avoid that in science as much as possible. So they were randomized to either the usual diet or a low carb diet. And this is not all that low, but what they found is that the low carb diet had greater weight loss. This is a, a kilograms, 2.2 uh, pounds per kilogram. And then we'll be talking about the triglyceride or total cholesterol HDL ratio, which is a combination of these. And uh, both diets got better. And then the A1C, that a marker of blood sugar and diabetes, there was a trend for the low carb diet to do better. Um, uh, we went a step further in our research study, which was uh, overweight or obese volunteers with diabetes randomized to either a low GI diet or a low carb diet. The low carb diet was at the 20 gram or less per day. The low GI diet was uh, about 100 grams of carbs with low GI carbs. And both groups did well. 
both groups on average did better. Here are the individual results with the A1C. You can just do the eyeball test that there's more action over here on the low carb ketogenic, you know, more spread. Some people, this one person went from 12 down to six on the A1C. It's a slow process teaching other doctors. There are doctors in my area, my clinic, immediate clinic area, the first time they get one of my patients, they say, gosh, that guy's doing really well. And then they say, ah, oh, you know. Second time the patient comes, hmm, that patient did really well, we share patients. And, but lightning can strike twice in the same spot, right? And then the third, the fourth, the fifth, maybe there's something to it. And then they start referring all their patients to me. And now it's a six month waiting list to get in to see me locally. I'm trying to clone myself and, and bring in other docs. But one doctor who knows me well um, took a patient with an A1C of 12 and calmly said, you need to stop eating carbohydrate. He, his BMI was maybe 30, so he wasn't really that much overweight. Um, and in one month, his A1C was almost normal. So any other doctor would have put him immediately on insulin or Bieta or other medication, and then you get stuck in that you have to eat carbs to eat to the medication, otherwise your blood sugar will go low. So even if the A1C is really high, the diet may be really, really powerful and the only thing that you need to, to change. And of course, this is with monitoring. Remember, I'm a doctor. These people have come to see me and, and have gone through a history and physical and I check blood tests. And if someone's not feeling well, there's certain things I think about. So um, if you try this on your own, you know, you, your mileage may vary, as they say. And um, not that I seem anything bad, but um, just to give that as a, a caveat. Um, as an aside, we not only look at diabetes, but we look at the cholesterol and all that stuff. And you're going to hear in great detail today about how the low carb on this side versus low GI on this side has a recurring theme of raising the good cholesterol, the HDL cholesterol, and lowering the triglycerides. So in this diet, the triglycerides went down 19%. And on this side, the LCKD, the low carb ketogenic diet, went down 67.5%. So, you know, when someone says the diet does something, you want to know, well, it does that, how much does it do it? So I talked to other investigators, well, our diet lowers the triglycerides. And I said, yeah, but, but our diet lowers it four times, three times greater. So you want to know the magnitude of the effect as well. Um, so all of the other parameters looked really good. Um, about seven years ago, based on the science, we opened a clinic at Duke University called the Duke Lifestyle Medicine Clinic. And um, while at Duke we have residential programs where people can come from all over the world to spend about $2,000 a week to be told not to eat much and to exercise in the gym and to <laughs> talk to a psychologist. Um, you get your hand held as well. Um, they don't have such great results there. They, they had a low carb plan when I worked at the Duke Diet and Fitness Center about 10 years ago, and then there was no champion for it when I left. But that, that experience got me excited about lifestyle medicine. I saw people coming to town getting off their medications in a week, and that was very influential for me to want to do this as a, in a practice. So I opened a clinical practice that's mostly insurance based and even Medicare, Medicaid, right next to the teaching clinic for our internal medicine residents at Duke. And over the last um, year, we introduced a new electronic medical record system so we were able to extract the information. So this is a consecutive sample of diabetics for, since the introduction of that electronic medical record. 35 people. So the average age of my patient is 58 years, mostly women, 80% women, and half are, are white, half are black, um, African American. The average weight is 250 pounds, which is a BMI of about 40. And uh, so I think this is a little different environment than what I see in, in this uh, room here today. But that's what I'm faced with. And, but these, I followed these patients over eight months since the introduction of that, eight months on average. And here's what I found. I presented these at our American Society of Bariatric Physicians meeting last fall. And there was an average of about a 30-pound weight loss, which means a lot of people lost 
more, a lot of people lost less, that's just the average, which is stati statistically significant. But uh, I also was able to find that 11 of the 34 didn't do what I said, didn't come back, didn't, uh, didn't follow through, it's, but I was able to find them in the computer system. So this is sort of a, a control group, uh, but it wasn't a randomized trial. They were, so they were all motivated to come, more or less. Um, so about a third of the people didn't come back to see me, but what I was able to find out is that their weight didn't change uh, over that period of time when they didn't see me, and then their A1C didn't improve, their blood sugar didn't improve. You could see this as kind of the usual care, uh, doesn't change much, but we had a, about a 1.1% reduction in A1C, which is equivalent to a medication effect, which and all I was doing was putting people on a low carb ketogenic diet, pulling people off medication. So here's some individual results. Um, for example, this 65 year old male over eight, eight month period of time had a reduction in A1C from 7.4 to 5.2 percent. Remember normal being under 5.5 or 6. And this person's weight went down 37 pounds, was on no medication. <laughs> Now go down here, this woman over 11 months didn't have much of a change in A1C, although it went down 0.5%. The weight went down 12 pounds, which is not all that much, but the insulin was removed. So the blood sugar was as good off the medication. Not bad. We can do better. So how about reducing someone from 136 units to 30 per day? with an A1C going from 10.2 to 8.6% with about a 13 pound weight loss. So I don't know how to do this perfectly. A lot of it is the implementation of the patient. What I say is if you do what I say, it's gonna work. But I can't make sure you do what I say. And although when people see these kinds of results, they get more motivated. So most doctors have never had this experience. They can't even say, yeah, you can come off your insulin. Remember, they want you to be a good diabetic. Take your medicine, eat your carbs. The tempo of this is pretty cool. So this is a flow sheet we developed. The, the blood sugars are here, the minimum and the high, minimum, maximum, and the blood sugar. This is the insulin units in a bar chart, and this is time in weeks. So this person was on 100 units of insulin per day, blood sugars ranging from 120 to 135. In the first visit, I cut the insulin in half. Otherwise, they'll get low on the blood sugar. The medicine is titrated to the food. More food that has carbohydrate, more medicine. So if you cut carbohydrate, you have to cut back the medicine unless someone's blood sugar is really, really high, and then they'll still not get low. So this person came off insulin over six weeks with a blood sugar of ranging between 110 and 130. The weight loss was five pounds. The point being, this was just treating the food. There was hardly any weight loss. There was hardly any insulin resistance being fixed underneath, behind the scenes. It was treating the food. Another patient of mine came off 180 units of insulin in two days never used insulin again because he was drinking two liters of Coke every day. Two liters of Coke multiply out the sugars. He was using insulin to, to cover the Coke he was drinking. Fortunately, you can have Diet Coke. Yeah. So I'll talk about implementing a diet the last, um, last lecture today. This person came off 100 units of insulin in four weeks. Titration down, blood sugars ranging from 100 to 200. Point being, off medication, the blood sugars were as good or better than before. Wow. Just by changing the diet. Weight down about 17 pounds. So we may have addressed some of the insulin resistance by helping the weight loss as well. Uh, so it's probably a combination of the insulin resistance getting improved and also the diet being addressed to treat that diabetes. None of these, pa none of these patients changed their sedentary lifestyle. So there was no effect of, in of exercise added in here. <coughs> Not that I'm against exercise, I'm just saying that you don't need it. I want people to exercise. In North Carolina, I tell you, I gave up. <laughs> to asking people to exercise, really. But then you get over a BMI of 40, forget it. I mean, it hurts. 
You have no energy. Uh, so welcome to my world. Um, 275 units of insulin almost off in three weeks. Have to see this person back. The blood sugars were ranging from 150 to 220 and were immediately improved, not totally to normal, which would be 80 to 100. And this person lost nine pounds. This is my chicken scratching for you, you, those of you who use insulin in your practices. This is the short acting three times a day and the long acting twice a day. I just add it all up, cut it in half, split it out. I don't know if you should put, keep people on long acting or short acting or I, I don't know. If the blood sugar goes under 100 or 120, do not take insulin at that time. I write that out. I give my cell phone. If you have any question, you call me. I rarely get called. The last call I got was, my blood sugar is 80. Yeah, how are you feeling? Great. But I'm not on my insulin anymore. Yeah, that's good. That's normal. <laughs> He'd been on insulin for 15 years. A blood sugar of 80 meant that he was too low for 15 years. And now it's normal. So I reassure people that, no, that's good. That's normal. And um, these are my happiest patients who come off insulin, I have to say. 173 units of insulin off in two weeks. Blood sugar is better. Now, there's still some insulin resistance going on. This person's BMI is probably 35. So I didn't fix the diabetes immediately just by addressing the food, but we got a long way. Now, another thing you need to know is being on insulin makes it really hard to lose weight. Now, not impossible, because you see these people losing weight, but it pushes the body toward making fat and fat storage and weight gain. Makes a lot of people hungry. So this also fixes the hunger. I'll talk about that later. But I wanted to show you a, a glimpse of treating type 2 diabetes, these three factors. Uh, how am I doing for time? You're right, right at 10 o'clock. Right. Right. Okay, so let me scoot through the insulin. So there's another reason why you might lower insulin levels, and that's because it might contribute to cancer. Otto Vorberg described this in 1931, and the science is just kind of being done now kind of a neglected area. Animal studies show a signal that you can decrease growth of tumor cells. Yeah, you can't like zap them and kill them, but tumors don't grow as well. And at Duke, we have a urologist who's studying prostate cancer, and he injects the cancer into mice and sees if, how long they live and how big the tumors are. And, and lowering the calories a lot or lowering the carbs, which lowers calories too, but not to the same degree has an inhibiting effect on the cancer growth. Uh, there was a, a TV piece that went on last f summer about the ketogenic diet, so the word's out there. There are some anecdotes. The science really isn't there. I'm just going to the, the uh, human level. There's some pilot studies showing you can keep people who have cancer on these diets. So this is like the preliminary to other more formal studies. Um, Rationale behind it is insulin makes cells grow, so lower the insulin. Also, glucose and insulin has a pro-inflammatory or increases the inflammation in the body. And there's a, a theory that's gaining, gaining more support that a lot of cancers are from the inflammation. This is a study uh, that shows that. And then why wouldn't you just have an approach to lower inflammation to reduce breast cancer, for example? So this is the theoretical basis for using it. A couple of technological advances I want to let you know about is measuring the breath ketones and blood ketones and urine ketones. This company has a, a product that's not uh, approved yet and, and these are preliminary data, but um, in an individual, one person checking blood ketones, urine ketones, breath ketones, glucoses. This is the morning, a little shaded, and then the evening. So this is 11, 9 in the morning, 0.2, in the afternoon, 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 1.2. But what we're seeing is the blood ketone levels are higher in the evening, later in the day. So if you're measuring ketones and you only check in the morning, don't be too frustrated. I see some nodding of the heads. Now, also, urine is not as accurate as blood. Now, we don't know if breath is better than blood or ketone, but I learned that a long time ago and stopped using the urine ketones in the clinic because it just wasn't jiving with what I was seeing. There were a lot of people who were having success, but they weren't having urine ketones. So I think we can see, uh, so this person was in ketosis 
had levels that were above this threshold. So we're just defining what does ketosis mean? What level is it that you need to be at? And the blood sugars here do go down as the ketones go up. So we're, it's interesting to see this. We're actually developing, I, I think we're developing new normals for that. Uh, and hopefully optimal. Another technology that uses a ketogenic diet where they put in a nutritional smart tube, it's being called, and so you don't eat anything for 10 days. You have some stuff put in the feeding tube. You walk around with this thing. You know, it's another technology. Um, there are a lot of people who say, just cut me and go for bariatric surgery. And, I, and for those people who want someone else to help them, the feeding tube diet may be appropriate as a, a way bef on the way before bariatric surgery. So I'm not saying it's that I would do it or it's right for you, but there are some people who, who will go for that. So low carb diets create a fuel metabolism using fatty acids and ketones, minimizing glucose. They're safe and effective. And I think I'm way over time. So I'm gonna last, on the, my last slide, there are a lot of predictions that didn't come true. Nostradamus said the end of the world, 2012, didn't happen. The Y2K, all computers would fail and didn't happen. That virus is a pussycat, said a, a UC Berkeley professor about HIV. Uh, yeah, well, sorry. The teaching that eating dietary fat was bad was based on a prediction on studies that were predicting what would happen. And when the appropriate studies were done, the prediction that eating dietary fat would adversely affect health didn't come true. The prediction that the low-carb, adequate protein, high-fat diet is harmful didn't come true when the studies were actually done. And we're here to share that information with you today to dispel notions, wild myths, and hopefully teach you about the low-carb, high-fat diet. Thank you very much. <laughs>